Okay, very good morning everyone. Wednesday 10th of July, so I hope you are well. I'm gonna cover off a couple of different things. This guy you can see to the side of my screen at the moment, Boris Johnson, of course, in a live televised debate on ITV last night with Jeremy Hunt. So we'll have a quick review of that and where do we go from here. Uh, we're also gonna have a look at some Chinese inflation data from overnight. And then, of course, the main event of which everyone's been waiting for this week, which is the first of the two testimonies from the Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Uh, and we'll, we'll break that down. I'll try and give it to you in as a simple fashion as possible. Uh, but looking at the, the charts this morning, not going to dwell on these too much. I'll leave that to Sam's handy work. Um, but WTI crude, just as I'm speaking, I can just see here, just popping up to fresh highs. And that does come after we had a significant drawdown of 8.129 million in last night's API crude oil infantries. And technically, you can see we've just broken above uh, kind of a high point of the last two day session. Uh, so decent little technical breach on a catalyst fundamentally inspired by the fact that the draw in the headline crude was so much more aggressive than that of what we had uh, against expectations. Um, otherwise, looking at other charts, we've got um, equity index futures just drifting a little south. I think too drastic at this point. Um, and the FX market's pretty much similar fashion as people are very much awaiting to hear from the, from the Fed chair. But again, I'll leave the charts to Sam. Let's go straight into the news then. And of course, um, this was one of the, the final parts, if you like, before the known Tory Prime Minister will be announced, I think it's July 23rd, so still going through the process of the grassroots members of the Tory party voting for their preferred candidate. Um, not sure if you did or didn't see the actual uh, debate in itself, but I did tweet immediately after the debate, and even though this is an incredibly small sample size, of course, of 39 votes, um, you can see here that, just putting it out there, Jeremy Hunt, 67% thought that it, he came across better, 33% for, for Boris. Um, again, without being too <laughs> too opinionated, I, th I thought I thought Boris was just not good at all, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, but I don't really think that that matters. This is kind of the state I see, not just UK, but largely politics in general, particularly in the Western world, where just banging the drum on a specific point, irrespective of any detail, and also just trying to outshout your other candidate, um, has been an effective strategy for, for, for many, and you know who, Donald Trump, of course. So um, does it really change the point? Well, not really, because if you remember, um, it's this who's going to vote for the Conservative leader is not the British public, but the 160,000 odd Conservative members, which I think is a representation of an incredibly small amount. I can't remember what the percent was of the UK population. Um, but they, you know, the, the odds would say, given internal Tory polls, that Boris has still got this very much in the bag. I'd be interested to see the bookies' odds this morning because prior to the debate, Boris was at about 95%. Uh, perhaps he's come back a little bit because um, I thought Jeremy Hunt came across way better than Boris yesterday, just my, my two pence. But where do we go from here? Um, obviously, lots of different options. I mean, you know, the most incredible thing, I don't know if you saw a tweet I did at the weekend, but I, I did a picture combined on a layout of Boris Johnson at the Heck Sausage Factory with sausages around his neck while Jeremy Hunt was playing cricket with some small children. Uh, there's just this small issue, of course, that we've got to sort Brexit out. But obviously this whole kind of drama and the razzmatazz around trying to just generate interest in their own candidacy is kind of detracting from the point that there's a highly complex trade and economic situation to deal with. And, you know, once all of this drama finishes you know we've got to revert back to this kind of decision tree which is what exactly is this outcome and, and where exactly are we going and and obviously the two candidates represent two different kind of approaches one being more boris on the no deal front but even if you persevere with a no deal 
a very interesting vote actually happened last night. So the House of Commons yesterday uh, voted to pass a measure proposed by the pro-EU Conservative Dominic Grieve uh, to make it harder for Parliament to suspend or, or basically to suspend the Parliament current session, this proroguing idea that we discussed uh, yesterday. Now the vote was incredibly close, it was 294 to 293. Now this is important because this is one of the things that um, Boris has not said he's going to do but is not equally taking it off the table because one of the strategies to force through a no deal credible threat against, let's say, to really put it out there against Europe that you're being serious would be to shut Parliament down so Parliament can't block it in terms of um, taking that option away but the vote last night was meaningful to counteract that. Um, subsequent parts of Greaves' deal were voted down, but it definitely just goes to show that there's still appetite within the lower house of Commons to block a no deal option. So as much as, again, the drum can be, can be banged by Boris, ultimately is his hands gonna be tied and we remain in a similar situation that we had with Theresa May. Uh, but if we go through that, and let's say a no deal is pursued, Parliament says no, forces the PM back to Brussels, let's say this is Boris, um, and then you go back to the renegotiation, EU says no, we go back in circles, does this then ultimately need something like a general election uh, or a second referendum to kind of break the impasse? Or do we go down the route of minor concessions out of the EU? Do they, you know, is that an, a prudent strategy to kind of you know, show that we're being serious by having this threat of no deal. A concession comes, the deal's then passed, and we have a smooth, orderly Brexit. Um, or negotiations drag out, and we go to a general election in 2022. I see that as incredibly unlikely that we're going to last until 2022 in the current status or composition of Parliament, the way things are going at the moment. I'd imagine if we did have that, is most much likely to be a more a, a snap election route. So yeah, more of these decision trees to be aware of, I think. Um, but how importantly is the pound reacting this morning? Well, you've, you've looked at the charts already. It really isn't. Uh, and that's really to do with the point that I'm saying, uh, even though I think Boris' performance was, wasn't particularly overwhelming. Um, it doesn't really detract from the point that he's still the odds on favorite. And so nothing's really changed too much. Uh, in that regard, the Dominic Grieve vote, I think, is quite interesting, particularly that as well, coming with, although still slightly uncommitted, but more of a push towards potentially second referendum option on whatever state of the deal or no deal from Labour. That could start to, uh, if anything, fundamentally support the pound, because either a second referendum or a, a, a blocking of the ability to push through a no deal would all be pound positive things. So definitely worth keeping an eye on this, how it plays out. But this morning, fairly tame reaction. Remember, in the intraday market, people are not focused on so much the pound now. They're focused on the dollar because we've got such a big event looming this afternoon. Elsewhere, um, just a, a quick glance at this. This is, a, this is a graphic of Chinese producer and consumer prices, um, the latter in blue. And as you can see, a little bit of a divergence. Consumer prices moving higher and above 2% at the moment. Um, this comes after what you've had in China. Really, swine fever has impacted um, pigs and subsequently the price of pork, which has direct implications then for uh, food in prices and consequently inflation. So hence the reason why consumer prices are higher. One of the more things that has drawn some attention though is that if you actually look at the white line, the white line, although flirted with zero when you remember we we're having that big stock market rout in Q4 uh, and fears about the escalating trade war, although we recovered in Q1, we're now back at that kind of flat line zero. So almost moving into deflationary territory for producer prices, which does go to show a bit of a reflection of the global state of things and this, this pessimism about global growth where demand could be waning on the industrial side, which is obviously very important for China. So some interesting developments there overnight, but again, read across for overall markets, I would say is fairly tame. Going over to the main event then, this is uh, Jerome Powell, and I'm gonna be doing a, uh, I'm going to go over this, if I just bring it into the 
into the screenshot. I'm going to run through very, very briefly um, what we're looking at for today from Jerome Powell. So, first of all, just understanding the, you know, I need, I need to. I think the spacing hasn't worked because I've squeezed my screen here. So you'd have to apologise for the. The, the solitary E here. <laughs> it wouldn't be like that if this was full screen without the video feed. But the point being is Congress is divided into two distinct chambers, as you know. You've got the Senate and the House. Now, you know, the same thing, I don't know if you caught that Bank of England documentary on the BBC last night, but you know, the Bank of England, much like the Federal Reserve, um, they are accountable to the politicians about what it is that they do. So if you think about it, politicians, existing governments are in place to, because they have been, through a democratic vote, voted by the people to deploy various different ways and means to manage the society and by net result the economy of which we all live in. Now what they do then is they have a central bank who operates independently, who they choose the people who run these institutions, but they know that these people are better equipped, equipped and more skilled at doing that job given the complications there are with trying to manage an economy and how, you know, how complex monetary policy is. So what happens is then these are supposed to be independent. The Fed in this case goes away, does its thing under the leadership of Jerome Powell. But just like Mark Carney in the Treasury Select Committee to the Treasury in the UK, this happens, this is a semi-annual testimony where the head of the Fed, Powell, the Fed chair, has to speak to the politicians of the House and then needs to repeat that process speaking to the Senate Banking Committee the day after. So that, this, this is what's happening over the course of the next two days. Very important point here for any of those new to this situation or this event. Um, one, this is a very important um, historically speech that he delivers because it, it acts as a platform outside of the regular eight Federal Reserve meetings that the Fed use typically to communicate their latest feelings about current economic conditions and forward monetary policy um, going ahead in time. Now, the second point that's really important here is that basically he speaks in front of the House Financial Services Committee first, that's happening today, and that is the most market moving. He then copy paste repeats that speech to the Senate Banking Committee on Thursday that is not market moving at all so even though the event in itself and he's still saying the same content you know this is the idea about fundamentals and the impact of news the market will have fully digested and traded the information from today's event meaning that when it gets recycled and repeated the same speech but to a different collection of politicians it has zero impact so that's what's happening today. Looking at, obviously, the, the order of play, um, I've, I've checked this out this morning. So Powell himself doesn't actually start speaking until 3 p.m. London time, but that doesn't really matter because when he speaks, you're already going to know exactly what it is he's going to say. That's because the text of Powell's speech released under embargo will be at 1.30 London time. So forget 3 o'clock, 1.30 is the main event for today. That's when this speech, when all the financial news wires like Bloomberg will drop all of the predefined chosen comments that have come out, and that's when the market will go into a high flux of volatility and we'll get all the information that we need to ascertain what the Fed are going to do in the future. He speaks at 3, he reads out the fixed statement, he then goes into, and this is a broad approximation, but typically... He, every member of the House Financial Services Committee will have an allotted time to ask him questions. Um, the Q&A, very different from a central bank quarterly inflation report or a summary of economic projections from the Fed, very different in the sense that it's not, say, financial press who are a bit more savvy about the type of questions the markets want to know and therefore potentially more market moving the Q&A. The Q&A in this event, in the semi-annual testimony, is nearly always non-market moving because the politicians basically just have a go at Powell and it's all very political led or politically led rather than being anything of real substance for us as market participants. 
Um, what are we looking at? Well, the whole basis of what we're looking at today from the testimony is not so much are they going to cut in July. We know they're going to cut in July. Uh, that's not up for debate. Uh, markets are still 100% convinced of that fact. What you can see here, though, is quite a distinct divergence between the pink and blue line at the end of last week. And that was because the prospect of a 50 basis point rate cut at the end of this month um, dropped s severely on the back of the fact that the jobs data in non-farms was so strong on the headline figure. And so we're anticipating 25 basis point rate cut. So that's fine. I have always been of the belief that 50 basis points wasn't going to materialize. It never was the base case. But that now has been very much priced off the table. Um, what are we looking for then? Well, a couple of other different things, particularly in the language of which Powell and his statement and also potentially some of the answers when he gets questioned from politicians, um, is the impact of the trade war. Obviously, the ongoing trade war that the US government is having, this protectionist policy aiming at predominantly China, but also the European countries and Mexico and Canada and so on, um, what's the impact and the view of that on what the Fed think about um, the economy or the impact on the economy and the subsequent policy that's going to be needed in the future? All in all, I think that you know Powell is a very savvy character now in the way he responds to these, these questions. I think he's unli unlikely to really commit or comment specifically or directly. Um, to give you a bit of context, though, when asked before whether a trade deal between the US and China would diminish the case for cuts. He stated that the Fed does not just monitor one development, citing global growth as another factor that the Fed is cognizant of, as well as inflation and jobs growth. So again, this is very central banking 101, very uncommittal, but also keeping it on the table with your options there to respond as you see fit to incoming developments. So in this case, highlighting not just a trade war, but inflation and jobs at the same time. Um, although G20 ended positively, um, there was no, obviously, implementation of the risk of further tariffs on the remaining goods from China. Um, it still does remain a sticking point. One of the big headlines we've had just in, in the last couple of days, um, it's been a bit mixed, actually. I read this morning that um, the US are loosening some of the conditions around this idea on the specific sanctions on Huawei, which was one of the big things a few weeks ago, which is a positive. However, um, we've also had China being very upset by uh, the agreement that the US are going to sell over $2 billion worth of military arms to Taiwan, uh, which is a very hot topic uh, domestically in China about the sovereignty of that particular uh, island. So. The bottom line here, as I've defined in that bottom bullet point, is how much risk does Powell place on the trade war? The more he almost talks about it, almost the more dovish that's probably likely to be interpreted, i.e. the bigger risks that there are. Um, one of the big things here, and, and again to summarize this, is it's not so much about the July rate cut. What the market really is um, zoning in on when this event unfolds is what do we get out of the communication that gives us guidance for how severe a rate cut cycle and how aggressive and quickly the Fed are going to cut rates. So for this year, obviously, we're priced for about a 75 basis points worth. So that would be in a usual cycle about 25 basis point cuts. So three rate cuts. You know, is that appropriate? Remember, the market has nearly always overextended or overreacted to Fed communication, i.e., Typically, the Fed now, from what they're saying to what the markets are saying, is the, is the market in overly dovish positioning? And therefore, is there a potential for a hawkish reaction today? And a lot of that could be defined by his assessment on the trade war. Um, this is one thing to be aware of as well. And, you know, why are we cutting rates in the US? Well, as I've put here in the title, what about after July? We know that rate cuts happening. Well, this is a look at um, US GDP. Now, the US economy grew by an annualized 3.1% in Q1 of 2019. That's a, that's a healthy number. 
But if you were to kind of, you know, this, this is backward looking, of course, to Q1. Think about where we are now. Uh, I keep reading more and more articles over the last few days about um, downplaying corporate earnings season and about how it's going to be quite a tough earnings um, era at the moment, particularly with forward looking guidance and how the global economy is slowing and we've seen this uh, materialize in the PMIs and so on. So the question mark is not so much that, okay, Q1 was quite strong, 3.1%, what, what does Q2 look like in America? And so what people look at is this. This is the Atlanta Fed GDP Now model. Uh, and in summary, the Atlanta Fed, what they do is they, they basically mimic um, the, the BLS model and its various different component weightings that generates this GDP uh, forecast. Uh, the quite neat thing, though, about this particular model and the reason why the market follows it at the Atlanta Fed is because it, it basically recalculates and updates almost in real time whenever there's major US economic data. So if anything, you're getting a rolling mathematical calculation of what then should be the outcome for Q2 GDP. Uh, and the point being here is that I think the latest estimate, and this is the Atlanta Fed GDP now estimate, is down at 1.3%. I think the last time I checked, which is the green line. So if you were comparing this by numbers, um, just look at this. This is Q1 GDP, 3.1%. If the GDP now model is correct and we drop to 1.3% in Q2, don't forget, that put, puts us down at the lowest level of growth in the US, definitely in the last couple of years. Yeah, Hence the reason why Trump is so vocal about trying to talk the market up. Hence the reason why Trump is so critical of Jerome Powell and the Fed's policies that they should be cutting uh, more aggressively to prop the market up because on the balance of the economic data Q2 GDP is anticipated to be the worst in definitely going back to prior to 2016 so it'll be the worst US growth since the Trump era of being US president and he's fully aware of that so definitely the, the conditions warrant not just one but possibly further rate cuts to come from the US um, so policy options um, questions here that the market will be looking for clarity on will be one what is the pace of rate cuts for the west rest of the year one and done now perhaps two or three is there a possibility of a 50 basis point rate cut at the end of the month maybe the market is has misread the idea that just because we had a one you know one big outperforming job creation figure in non-farms a few days ago Maybe the Fed want to keep the option there that, you know, hang about, maybe we do need to go go big and go hard fast to get it, get it in and show the market that we're serious with our intentions. And so, you know, I think that that's a very low probability that that will be the case today. I think if anything, I think that Powell, uh, I hate to disappoint intraday traders, but Powell is, is so good now at managing these types of things, even though this is quite a a difficult balance. I feel that he'll manage this quite well and irrespective of short-term volatility, I do think we might finish the day and um, we'll still be s s set on the same path, which is a rate cut in July, followed by um, the indication of further rate cuts to come with the option being that they will be responsive to incoming data and developments. That's my kind of overall summary. Um, third point, what if Powell delivers a, a hawkish cut? What I mean by that is this idea of kind of they cut rates in July, but then they sound quite quite upbeat that maybe they just want to see how the market reacts to that one event and then look to take action accordingly. That would be deemed or classified very hawkish in regard to comparison to current market positioning. So the likelihood is there, yields would rise, dollar would rise, equities would fall under that scenario. Um, an interesting stat for you, you've probably heard me say it before, but the Fed have never not delivered on a policy change when the market is priced at over 50%. Remember, the market's priced heavily for a rate cut, 100% in fact. And so for the Fed not to deliver it on the end of July rate cut uh, would be uh, a massive blow to the central bank's credibility. That would be a 
absolute and all-encompassing failure of monetary policy, banking and communication. The point being then is if they wanted to take July off the table completely, let's say, as as a zero prospect as I think that that, it, that is, then Powell needs to come out and say something super hawkish to realign market expectations. Uh, that would have the most severe impact on markets today. But again, I would say that is the most unlikely scenario. Um, this is one other thing I want you to be aware of, is that after today, remember what I said, the Senate speech really is, is a non-event, but actually on Thursday and Friday, this is the list of Fed speakers that you have. Uh, this is what I call the Fed protection team. And it's a classic strategy adopted by the Federal Reserve when there is a very important, big, potentially market-moving speech from the, the Fed chair. They basically um, schedule in a whole host of speakers. And you've basically got the full spectrum here from hawks like Barkin, uh, and more center hawk, but Williams. Then you've got the most dovish member of all, Kashkari. You've got a mix, Evans, uh, Kwale, Williams, all voters, uh, Bostic, Barking, Kashkari, non-voters. The point being here is that what you might get is that if there is a large bout of movement, these guys will come in and look to realign market expectations with further kind of forward guidance. Uh, very, very classic strategy in central banking. Um, the other thing to be aware of as well is that later on tonight, um, even though uh, I think that the minutes will be dwarfed by the release at 1.30 from Jerome Powell, what is also coming out this evening at 7 o'clock is the Fed minutes of the June mid-June meeting. So not only have you got Powell, you've got the Fed minutes tonight, and then importantly, remember that statement that Powell said, giving that, that guidance to markets, he did also mention that inflation is to, is, is to be monitored closely in terms of their decision making. That is part and forms part of their dual mandate. And so US CPI, in fact, is due at 1.30 on tomorrow, on Thursday. And that will be a particularly important um, point as well to have a look out for. Um, by the end of this week, given what Powell says, and given what the CPI data comes out as, as well as the Fed minutes, we should be in a much better position for uh, a, a fairer re reflection of the, the current status of what is it that the Fed are going to do by the end of the year. So with that being said, the likelihood is that probably the most market movement of the week is going to come over the course of the next 48 hours. All right, that's it from me. Um, quick look at the calendar and then I'll hand you over to Sam. So that's, that's your Fed wrap. But I'm sure we'll go over that again closer to the time at 1.30. Here's the calendar for today. Um, do be aware for the UK, you've got the release of um, UK GDP coming out a bit later. Uh, the GDP estimate, three months or three months figure, expected pretty flat, excuse me. Um, the month on month estimate here for May 0.3, year on year 1.3. Um, so yeah, UK GDP alongside though, manufacturing industrial output, goods trade balance and construction output. So a couple of things there to keep an eye on. You kind of know the state economically of the UK as we've seen with the PMIs last week. Uh, things are uh, kind of gradually feeling the bite of the Brexit blues, uh, if I can put it that way. And so things have been materially slowing is the general theme. So if manufacturing output industrial was to, was to spike higher, um, let's say GDP was surprisingly strong. These would all have quite short-term positive reactions in the pound, given the overwhelming short bias um, fundamentally for, for sterling at the moment. Otherwise, other quite interesting things this afternoon. Bank of Canada have got their interest rate decision. Uh, not actually expecting any change in rates there. Uh, rates currently reside at one and three quarter percent. And then you've got the, uh, the DOE oil infantry numbers. So just quickly, I know Sam will look at the charts himself in a, in a second. But the numbers, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the briefing, um, we had a drawdown last night of 8.129 million. Way bigger drawdown than what we were expecting. Cushing a draw of 754,000. Gasoline, 257,000 draw. Distillates build 3.69 million. Crude is up about a dollar as I am speaking, uh, helped by technical levels being breached and the capitalists being obviously an aggressive drawdown on the infantry situation. All right, 
that's it from me. Uh, have a good day. Good luck for PAL if you're trading that event. Thanks very much. Hi guys, good morning. I hope uh, we're all doing well. I have a quick look over uh, the charts, how we're trading just uh, 40 minutes now through the European Open and the DAX, which came under a bit of pressure, brought uh, US equities down with it. We're now below the pivot, but uh, found a bit of support as we neared uh, towards the, the S1. There was also a couple of previous resistance levels from uh, yesterday, which of course we hadn't really tested since breaking through those uh, around 10, 11 yesterday. So that's just found support. So keeping an eye on the, the DAX, obviously the key level now remains to be that uh, that pivot point, which offered a bit of support this morning before we broke through it uh, at seven. If, uh, if that is to break uh, the US equities, which are, uh, well, with the Dow underneath the pivot, the NASDAQ, uh, the NASDAQ, the code right you can see never actually made it through but also the S&P similar to the Dow uh, was just below there so this is the key level here for uh, the S&P and then of course uh, I'll be keeping an eye on 29.79 three quarters uh, the area of support before we push lower in correlation with the DAX there so uh, not of course out the, the woods I'll be keeping an eye on what the DAX does around its pivot level uh, we'll come back onto the S&P shortly, uh, but that is a, a key point, key zone if you like. A uh, bit of the retest here, just below the, the pivot as well. Euro was stuck in a, a tight range yesterday, it just doesn't really want to move at the moment it seems. Uh, however, we did have a nice spike higher this morning uh, up towards the, the R1 retests of, of different trend lines from yesterday, which you can see offered a bit of an opportunity on that breakthrough was also retested late last night at six and then again this morning so that would have been a, a good trade back towards the previous high of, of the day that we had broken through however if we were to drift back up towards that uh, another test of that you just perhaps start to get worried but definitely as a uh, as a line in the sand you would still want to have this on uh, other than that to the upside the r1 and, and those highs from yesterday uh, and the day before from the the evening on, on Monday obviously remain quite important. You can see that coming in a zone just above the R1. So even a break of that trend, I wouldn't necessarily get too carried away that this market is going to push higher. To the uh, the upside, obviously, those uh, to the downside, I should say, those lows from yesterday and today, uh, all quite key. S1 marking up pretty much bang on yesterday's low uh, as well. The pivot, while chopped up, could be a, a bit of a guide if you're looking for a uh, place to, to go short if we can clear that area uh, you might feel uh, we then get a, a, a you know better test of those lows from yesterday this trend line spiked through around 7.15 but still well respected enough uh, that could give you the opportunity to, to get short on the break of the pivot and that later on the pound uh, let's bring this into to picture now 125 an area of uh, resistance of course we do have numbers out at 9.30 though, uh, so just bearing that in mind. Uh, to the upside as well, the pivot remains key. Remains key like it was yesterday morning, but you've got some nice resistance from yesterday afternoon uh, as well uh, that is on there. The trend line from yesterday's lows, I mean, it was broken, I guess, early this morning. We've had a retest of that in an ideal world. If you're looking for the short at the pivot, that would also come in uh, around the same point. Uh, but for now, holding up uh, quite nicely, the uh, the price action just getting squeezed from the upsides and as long as we stay below this trend you've got to be happy to be short in this market target I guess if you're 125 short the low of the day and low of yesterday of course the lowest we've been for for some time but not looking too healthy at the moment for for the pound uh, just having a look over uh, quickly again to the DAX which is just trying to extend its its legs higher euro stocks uh, now above the pivot but that key level is literally being tested now similar to the S&P and that breakdown was just above the pivot so keeping an eye on what happens there for euro stocks Aussie dollar let's have a quick look you can see yesterday was a day where it just drifted lower and lower and that has continued today uh, key support coming in around the S1 you've got the low there from the 21st 
Uh, so keeping a, a monitor on what happens around there. Another example of this, these trend lines just breaking. It's been just beautiful, really, for the Aussie dollar in the last few trading days. Wait for the trend line break, go short, and uh, you're laughing, it seems. Um, but uh, looking for an opportunity on a pullback area. I mean, uh, if we have a look at yesterday's low, slightly chopped up. I mean, it's, 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 it's perhaps a, a tricky one to really work out where the best place to get in is now uh, for the short I mean if you could get back up to 69.41 you would take it uh, but maybe worth seeing the reaction that we get on this S1 uh, which as mentioned is that key level of support from uh, a couple of weeks back uh, as well yen which uh, was relatively choppy yesterday into the afternoon uh, has just hit, well, we we hit the the low from yesterday early this morning, and that along with the S1 has provided good support. We're in a bit of a range now. You can see here. Let's so let's bring this rectangle in. Pivot yesterday's evening's high and today's high as well. Probably best to wait either for, for either one of these to get long or short. Probably preferring the short, just given the recent trend of this market over the last couple of days. Uh, however, you can see other than that, I mean, you could argue just above the pivot is, is still nice other than that I'm not a massive fan of, of getting into a trade unless we got to the R1 or a break potentially of that S1 but just having a look here longer term levels below S1 yeah there is a bit of room to, to go down so while in a range I'm not too sure if we were to come back down to S1 low the day you'd want to go long uh, so maybe preferring to, to get that short higher up towards the uh, pivot point uh, as well for that market. Having a look over at gold and we'll have a look at oil as well after the API push higher. But uh, gold, which good opportunity yesterday morning on uh, the the break of that trend. We had a, a lovely retest of that uh, as well. Good opportunity to get short to S1. We then uh, found support on a, a previous level just before 10 o'clock for drifting back higher. Uh, and again, another opportunity when we broke the trend to the upside. So those trends are working nicely. Uh, you can see we're just having one developed here just over the last 15 minutes, one, two, three, keeping a, a close watch on that. So while perhaps this morning the pivot looked a really nice place to go short, if that trend line breaks, for me that takes away the idea of wanting to short the pivot, especially looking at the reaction we saw every time a, a trend line broke yesterday. To the downside, the, the lows are, are pretty good in, in level of support. That failed break of the, the low we had at 3.30, uh, so I'd still have that marked up uh, on the charts, but opportunity-wise, I think it would happen on a on a break of this trend, to be honest, rather than uh, looking to, to go short, pivot. Uh, to the downside, if we were to break those lows, just be careful, a lot of support just below their S1 and then the lows from yesterday uh, as well. Wrapping up here with oil, and we'll have a quick look one more time at what European and US equities are doing. Oil, you can see breaking out of that range from yesterday, helped by the API, Bit of a divergence, as you'd expect from those numbers with gasoline. Gasoline pretty much flat from 9:30 yesterday. Uh, oil, I would, you know, have the the view that we're going to remain going higher as long as we can stay above this trend. We're just finding support on what was the previous high of the Asian session, so 58.75 and around that zone here. Uh, as long as we stay above this, I would call that what 69, 10 tick, 10 tick level. You would be happy to to stay long while. The, the draw was big, you know, the opportunity of a break below that trend isn't the worst idea uh, in the world. Yesterday's high up towards R1 and, and that is the, the highest we've been since uh, last, well, the beginning of the month from the second, which you've got quite a lot of resistance around there. So even a break higher, just be careful. Uh, in terms of a place to get long lower down, I really do like uh, just below the pivot, 58, 14 kind of area. Uh, we've had quite a, a decent bit of price action over the last few days, which for me looks like it could be quite a nice place to uh, to get in there for, for oil. I'm going to look at uh, equities, obviously the DAX just slowing down, the euro stocks hitting that level perfectly, so resistance uh, in Europe just halting US equities recovery here and obviously that pivot, as we mentioned, for the S&P vitally important. Uh, so understandably, uh, the sellers just coming back in uh, in what is a pretty good level to have gone short uh, if, uh, if that was the bias that you had. Any questions as usual, uh, obviously please 
uh, do let us know. Data, just to run over that one more time, you do have some numbers out shortly from UK 9.30. So, uh, yeah, we've got, what's that, 40, uh, 45 minutes? I think my maths might be wrong there, maybe 40 minutes uh, before that comes out. Um, so if you're in the pound trade by 9.15, you really want to start unwinding uh, that position. Hope you will have uh, a good trading day uh, and good rest of the week if I don't catch up with you.